Hi guys, this is Steven here. I'm with my trusty sidekick, Jared Nickel, the executive uh, <laughs> something of ProjectSui.com. And we're off today. We're going to try and do another podcast. We don't have much to talk about, but we just miss ourselves so much and wanted to talk to each other in a, in a way that make it uh, less uh, less suspicious. So we have an, an official reason to do so. We'll just say we, we're doing a podcast, but really... Uh, Deep inside, I just want to hear your beautiful voice. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. The feeling's mutual. I'm actually sitting here practically in the nude because it's so hot outside. It's incredible. Thank God we're just uh, over microphones so nobody can uh, actually, we can't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well, let's kick this off with... Uh, with something we don't talk about anymore at all, because Nintendo has just given us so much stuff to talk about lately that uh, we've sort of ignored Microsoft and Sony for the longest time. So I wanted to just touch base on something that uh, I read this morning on Engadget that I thought was kind of cool, but I was looking for more information before posting it on the site, which is, apparently, where is it? I've got the article in front of me, but it's really weird. Basically, apparently there was a roadmap uh, for the Xbox that's dating back to sometime in 2010. This could be entirely BS, okay? But the fact that it actually originates from 2010 makes it, you know, makes it kind of like, okay, maybe there's some truth to this or whatever. And anyways, it's a 56-page document that goes over all the, uh, the basic plans that Microsoft had from 2010 till 2000 and... Uh, I don't even see the year here. Anyways, whatever. Basically, for the next... From, let's say till like uh, 2015. And what's very interesting about this is if this document is indeed from 2010, then, well, it's kind of intriguing because they mention stuff like, okay, we're going to release uh, an update for the Xbox 360 platform um, in terms of software or whatever, which eventually happened. Uh, they mentioned Kinect on this, that they're going to mention that they're going to release a camera system with 3D augmented. Uh, like uh, manipulation, which obviously became Connect. Um, they also mentioned Smart Glass, and I thought that was very interesting. Like about how they're going to be able to take software that you'll be able to link in with uh, the Xbox and put it on your uh, well. They don't say iPhone and stuff like that, but they just say like mobile devices. So I thought that was kind of neat. But obviously, the most interesting stuff is what hasn't already happened yet. And they put, like, next Xbox that the hardware is scheduled to arrive, well, tentatively, as of 2010, uh, is scheduled to arrive in 2013 for the price of $299. And it will include a second-generation camera system, which will incorporate four player, um, like four players at the same time. Now, obviously, they're referring to a Kinect 2. Um... But it's, it's just, it's very, very interesting how they say that, uh, like, for bullet points, for some of the uh, features for this so-called next Xbox, besides the 299 price point, is the fact that it would utilize Blu-ray and it would have a whole home DVR built into it and a low power always on, um, like, it would always be on, you'd always have access to it and whatever, sort of like... Um, well, sort of like the Wii had, you know, like uh, where it could glow and whatever. But the idea with this is that when you shut down the system, it, it would still actually be on so you could access certain features and it would just require just a little, little bit amount of, uh, of power. And then there's even, it even goes even crazier than that, that like by 2015, they're going to release something called Fortaleza glasses, which are 3D, like a 3D headset for like augmented reality uh, gameplay. I was like, okie dokie. And it sort of reminded me of that infamous Nintendo Revolution. Uh, remember that? That headset thing from back in the day? <laughs> no, not really, no. You never saw that? That was classic, man. Anyways. <laughs> so yeah, I just I thought this was kind of interesting. This could be like the biggest load of BS in the world, right? Someone could have just yeah. made this presentation up or whatever, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah, it is. The, the part that... Uh, Caught my eye was the 299 price point for the next Xbox, which would be awesome. But this sounds a, a little bit fishy, though. That some uh, some documents would be leaked now that were written in 2010 or something. But there, where there's smoke, there's fire usually. So I guess we'll uh, we'll have to see. 
Yeah, exactly. And um, if if this is indeed true, um, if this document was from Microsoft and from 2010, I think uh, you know a lot can change, as we all know, right? Like, uh, who knows when, like if any of this other technology or like the price points or the software or even the years that they're talking about haven't changed internally by now. But still, I, I love these sorts of like, you know, documentation. And it looks really good too. It doesn't look like fan made or anything. So props to whoever made this. If it was Microsoft, good for you. And if it was some like, you know, fan, well, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, it's your turn. Okay, I just uh, wanted to talk about a, a game that's coming out next week and uh, next week that probably most people are just gonna disregard and say it's another Pokemon spin-off or Pokemon title. But uh, the uh, game in question is actually called Pokemon Conquest, and it's one of the weirdest uh, collaborations that you've ever seen. It's a mix between the Pokemon games and a Japan-only uh, strategy RPG series that I can't, for the life of me, uh, remember. You probably know it more than I do, but it's basically a, a, a series that's always dealt with uh, when Japan became a nation on its own, when it uh, before where it was just uh, different states and whatnot. One guy uh, apparently uh, united Japan anyway. It's a series about that, and it's a strategy RPG series, and I think you're clicking for the name of it, so it's you're, you're going to have it in a few uh, seconds. <laughs> ambition, something about ambition, but whatever. Yeah, it's Nogunaga's ambition or something like that, right? Yeah, that's that's right. And the thing about it is that it uh, mixes apparently the reviews. The first review came out. Or IGN gave it gave it a nine. And the other, uh, I've read like I've seen videos. I've read reviews since it, it's been released in Japan, and everybody is basically saying that it's a fantastic game, like a fantastic strategy RPG on its own. And just for it to have the Pokemon name attached to it, just instead of adding a gimmick, actually makes the strategy RPG better because of it. Because you get the, the classic uh, Pokemon uh, style to it, where you have a, a lot of different creatures you're trying to catch, you're trying to raise, you're trying to make evolve and stuff like that. There's also the classic rock, paper, scissors uh, type of gameplay with Pokemon, where there's 15 different types and uh, fire beats grass and grass beats uh, earth and stuff like that. Ground, I mean. So it'll, it should add a lot of uh, elements for strategy RPG fans that they will just uh, eat up. And Pokemon fans will also uh, have another uh, game to try in, uh, in the meantime until uh, Pokemon Black and White 2 are released uh, later this year. So it's a game you should uh, definitely be on the lookout for uh, if you uh, have a DS, of course. The only sad part is that it's released for the Nintendo DS and not the 2DS, just like Pokemon Black and White 2. But since the 3DS is backward compatible, it shouldn't uh, stop anybody from trying this. Well, me, I have got to uh, start up on what you picked up for me, Pokemon Black. I really want to uh, try that out. I really want to try it out, actually. I'm really curious to see how, uh, like, it, like, you know, really sit down with it and give it a go because uh, I don't know anything about this series and I feel like a total noob here considering uh, it sold, like, you know, a bajillion copies. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's pretty well it. I, I'm I'm totally I'm officially done. I had a surprise for uh, those that don't know. Uh, I had a work related, uh, a real world work related. Uh, how can I say this? Like examination that I have to do. It's a practical examination, and so that's what I got to do on Tuesday. So I've sort of been out of the loop for the last few weeks, just going crazy trying to make sure I'm good to go. But I will. I promise I will uh, go ahead and uh, try my darndest to uh to get into pokemon black or at least you know even if i don't get into it at least you know look at what happened with uh oh goodness what was it called xenoblade yeah. i'm gonna at least do that where i'll play it for like you know i don't know 100 hours or whatever and then if it doesn't uh if it doesn't sink in then i'll say okay well that's enough yeah yeah that sounds about about right at least give it a fair chance and you'll see for yourself yeah, exactly. I'm sure. I'm sure. Like at the end of it, I'm gonna like it. I'm pretty sure because, like, I'm like you always say, I'm easily impressed. <laughs> yeah. And next on the agenda, I wanted to talk about another game, uh, Guatemala or Guacamole or whatever it's called, which it's a fun name to pronounce, but I'm never sure of it. And I think it's released. Uh, well, you probably know the exact release dates. 
And we're still supposed to get these guys on the, on the podcast one of these days, but this game is pretty much uh, looks like a, a solid buy because uh, we all know we all how much we love the Tales from Space Mutant Blobs attacks. And it looks funny because it looks like a side-scrolling kind of platformer, but with fighting, uh, like a traditional fighting jar elements to it, which looks awesome, to be honest. Yeah, it does look awesome, and you're absolutely right. I have to touch base with the guys because uh, they they said that they were very excited to join our podcast. Um, but that was they said like if we didn't mind like just to wait till after E3. But we didn't know at the time. Obviously, the reason they wanted to do that is so that you know they could obviously answer some of our questions a little bit better. So now that uh, E3 is over with, yeah, I'll, I'll send them an email after this podcast and just touch base and see what's up. But yeah, that game looks awesome. It. it it, at first, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, okay, it's like a Metroidvania type of game or whatever, you know, like, you know, it's something like that. And then um, when they added that whole dimensional thing to it, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, uh, I don't know, for those that don't know anything, of, like if I'm speaking uh, another language to you, uh, basically, you all know what Metroidvania games mean. Basically, you know, you'll get power-ups and whatever, be, re be able to revisit certain areas and blah, blah, blah. But the twist with this one is that you're able to sort of flip between two different, um, well, I, I'll call it dimensions until I know, I haven't read previews or anything yet, so I don't know actually what they're referring to it as. But let's say, let's say you walk to a certain point and there's uh, like a river of acid that you just cannot cross. Well, by switching the dimension, you might see that there's a bridge from the other dimension that's it's getting eaten away, but it hasn't fully been destroyed yet. And... If you mix that into the gameplay with, like, the Metroidvania style, I really think they've got something on their hands here. I mean, th it looks awesome, and their humor is by far, like, just the best. So I'm really, really excited for this. I know um, a couple of people I saw on uh, on YouTube and other things like that, they were showing, they were saying, like, you know, oh, why isn't it online enabled and blah, blah, blah. But for, for this, it's not like uh, the Nintendo podcast we had, because for this, I, I can understand. I mean, they're an indie developer that is very small. I mean, there's only a couple of people that are actually working on the title, and they plan to bring it to the PlayStation Vita and the PlayStation 3 through the PlayStation Network. Wow, that's a mouthful. And, um, and you know, I'd love for it to be online. I really would. Like, to have the co-op aspect online, I think that would be brilliant. But uh, at the same time, unless Sony is going to give them the funding to do that, to use their servers and stuff like that, it makes sense to me that obviously these guys are not going to be able to afford to do something like that on their own. Yeah, yeah, it does. So when is that game coming out? Did they, did they say something like holidays or fall? Or? It's from the best of my knowledge. Well, let me let me take a look. Uh, I don't think so, though. Oh, well. I don't think so. Uh, like, I don't think there was an actual... Um, whatever you want to call it, an actual release date here, but I'm just looking, guacamole.com, do, do, do. you guys might hear some funky music, let me mute my, all uh, right, blah, 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 uh, we're the most professional group ever, <laughs> yeah, okay, no, I don't see anything, I think it's later this year though, so probably around the holiday season, something like that, okay, and uh, just because you're on about that, I'm going to, stay on the Sony bandwagon for a while for those that are listening. I uh, downloaded a few games. I downloaded Gravity Rush and I downloaded um, uh, the Metal Gear Solid HD collection for the PlayStation Vita and have yet to even turn them on yet. That's how awesome I am. And not only that, but like the genius I am, I purchased, I can never pronounce it, it's uh, what, Gungnir, something like that. On the uh, for the PSP, assuming I could play it on the Vita, I, I purchased it from the PlayStation 3, and like a genius, I didn't read the fine print, so I turned on my PlayStation Vita, only to discover it says this title cannot be downloaded to the Vita. And I went crap on a stick, because <laughs> my PSP is somewhere in here buried, so I don't know what I'm going to do there, but I'll give you guys updates on those uh, when I get a chance to, uh, to just give them a quick spin. Like I said, after Tuesday, I'm going to be back in the gaming scene big time. But speaking of gaming scenes, or lack thereof, you wanted to mention something else, didn't you? Yeah, I just wanted, because uh, we had a podcast earlier a, few, a week ago or two about comic books. 
and I've been at a big, big comic book phase uh, lately, and I wanted to. Uh, I've discovered something. I, I I know I talked about it to you in our old thread uh, back in the the forums uh, that we had a year ago or two, whatever we used to talk about something. And I brought up a point that I really enjoyed about comic books. And I've been reading old Flash comics uh, recently, and this brought back uh, my interest in comic books. A, a point that I like about them is that it's science fiction, and that a lot of times they try to make it make it work. So, first off, I wanted to mention a book that I think everybody should read. I don't know if you've read about it or heard about it. I think you did. It's called The Physics of Superheroes, and it's by uh, James uh, Cacalios, or whatever his, however you pronounce it. It also has a, a super title, a, a subtitle, which is something like uh, uh, how come how most comic books get physics right. So it's pretty interesting because it says that although you always have to uh, grant like uh, one uh, miracle exception or two, sometimes you have to just uh, look away. But most often, the, the writers they try to make it uh, look uh, plausible, and that's something I always enjoyed about all comic books. They don't do that mystically at all nowadays. That's one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of magic in comic books because magic basically grants writers freedom to do whatever they want. I know it's fiction, you can write whatever they want whatever you want in a book, but it basically means that you can be lazy as Yeah, lazy as yeah. You can be very, very lazy in a book if you use stuff like magic because you you can basically say, well, it's magic. Because that's what I was reading a, a Wonder Woman book a few years ago. I think it's two years ago. And the book was pretty good. I was enjoying it. And all of a sudden, there was this guy f riding on a flying elephant. <laughs> like right in the sky, he was there on a freaking flying elephant. And right there, I just like exploded. Like these guys are not even trying anymore. It's like they say, oh, whoa, wouldn't it be cool to have an elephant fly and stuff like that? It's like... All they're trying to do is, is try and look badass or create cool stuff without even making any sense anymore. It's like in these Flash comics, though, the old, the old ones I'm reading, it's so so re interesting because of they uh, talk about time travel and and uh, how much uh, like it would take to for the Flash to go from one space to the other at certain speeds and stuff like that. It's just so much fun because it's actually like uh, the writers actually took a lot of time writing their stuff and did reach research and stuff like that which is what science fiction is all about if you go back and read like old science fiction books from like the 1800s or early 1900s a lot of the stuff they actually talk about in those books actually happen now and so that's why science fiction has always been uh, an, an interest like in most gamers and most nerds out there but I just find that sometimes with comic books, the, the writers, they have it so uh, easy when they can use like magic and whatever they want because honestly, like it's fiction. So the, the, a writer can write anything and it doesn't matter. He's he's the creator. He, he does what he wants. He's basically God. So I just wanted to mention this little uh, little aspect and I was wondering if you had any, uh, any more, anything to add on that subject. Well, yeah, sure, why not? I, I can add something to almost anything. I got such a big mouth. Um, <laughs> but no, that's why I like Star Trek and the Star Wars and stuff like that, especially like if you go back, um, I'll, I'll jump on the comics thing in just a sec, um, but if you go back to some of those like the original Trek, uh, yeah, it might be cheesy and it might be this, it might be that, it might be the other thing, but if you if you really stop and, and think of the different things that Gene Roddenberry thought of back then, it's unbelievable that today we are actually living in like this Star Trek era. I mean, I cannot believe the uh, like we've got devices like the iPhone or the iPad. I mean, right now Stephen is on his iPad, like uh, he might as well be in China. It doesn't really matter where he is. Um, and, and, you know, he's using a device that doesn't have any keys on it except for a home button. And he's communicating with me while he could be like, you know, doing other things on there. That, it's just sick. I mean, it's absolutely sick to see how science fiction has sort of evolved into science fact now. I mean, not everything, obviously, but, uh, I've always loved that. Always, always, always. And about comics, so the thing that ticks me off the most about 
comics in general is that uh, whenever there's uh, some sort of uh, a re reboot or a retcon or a rewrite or whatever you want to call it, 90% of the times they turn to magic to, uh, to sort of wipe it away. Now, I, I don't mind magic per se. I love fantasy, but I like fan fantasy based, like where magic is, is more like uh, stuff of, say, bringing... Um, like uh, how can I say this? Like calling down thunder or lightning, yeah, or, like, yeah, fire powers. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of fantasy. Don't get me wrong. That's why I really love like Red uh, Sanja and stuff like that. But I just hate it when instead of using like uh, science fiction or trying to make something work, they just use it as an excuse to make their story. Uh, yeah. Visually more interesting. Yeah, for sure. Like for me, the I'm still ticked off over uh, one more day, which was the. Uh, which was that Spider-Man reboot from a few years back, because that's exactly what they did. It was a magical thing, and because it was magic, they were able to bring characters back to life that were dead for years and years. They were able to uh, wipe people's minds, introduce other characters that were never part of the past, like just all kinds of stuff, and it was just simply done within one issue to the next issue. It was like... Spider-Man went to another universe, he might have well, or he might have just died and it was just some other character, because that's how it felt. It felt drastically different than what had come before, and that was all due to just some little magical, you know, poof. And I, I hate that. I hate that so much. And I, I love, like, uh, science fiction on, um, on, like, written stuff. I love fantasy. I'm, I'm a big fan of all the, the nerd stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's uh, that's about it, I guess, for uh, for for this uh, episode today. So yeah, I think so. I think that was pretty good. Yeah. And uh, to anyone who's listening from YouTube for the very first time, uh, we're gonna tr keep trying to get these on YouTube. I'm just a little concerned about the uh, size of the uh, like the length. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but anyways, we'll just uh, we'll keep trying to post them on YouTube, and uh, you know, you can subscribe through iTunes. Be sure to check out the site. You know, all that jazz, and. Uh, as always, thanks for listening, guys, and we'll be back shortly.